I've never seen a, a, a layoff cycle be over after just a few months. By the end of April, we should be closer to 370,000 run rate as the layoffs keep coming from, call it a 340,000 starting point. The unemployment rate continues to rise against the backdrop of record high credit card delinquencies. What does that tell us about where credit card delinquencies are headed? as the layoff announcements continue to come, because our starting point is a record high. Danielle T. Martino Booth, CEO of QI Research, returns to the show. She last spoke with me in January, and she told me that aggressive layoffs may be coming by March. Let's recap what happened this past month. It's April now. Will layoffs continue? We'll find out with Danielle, and we'll get her updated views on the markets and what the Fed's going to do next. If you're new to this channel, make sure to click subscribe in the button down below and click on the like button to spread the word. Also, a word from our sponsor, iTrust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space with Bitcoin prices having already breached new all-time highs. Now may be a time to consider an IRA for your Bitcoin profits. Click on the link down below, itrust.capital slash David, to get started and learn more. If you use my link, you get a $100 funding bonus as well. If you want to open a new account with cash, you can do so, or you can roll over an existing account. So click on the link or use the QR code, scan it to learn more and get started. Welcome back to the show, Danielle. Always good to see you. It's great to be here. I mean, it's it, it was a little bit chillier outside last time we saw each other in Vancouver, but it it's, was. it's great to be back. And uh, you're back in the you're back in the states. So um, good to see you again. Why don't we talk about first a recap of our discussion last time? You had said to me this was back in mid January that layoffs would be coming by March was what you said. We aired this. I'll put a link to the to the video in the description so people can check that out. And you had talked about how corporate debt which is rolling over sometime soon, would have to be refinanced at a higher rate. A wall of debt would come crashing down, and so people would have to start laying off workers. Um, many people commented on that video that layoffs haven't come yet. I'll let you address that. Um, so, I, I mean, I think uh, I think the people commenting that the layoffs have not come yet are possibly referencing the end of the world uh, because the layoffs have come and then some. So, you know, through the, call it through mid-April, okay? Because we're not finished with the month yet. So through mid-April, uh, year to date, we've got about 340,000 layoffs that have been tabulated. That includes this latest lob out of Elon Musk, about 14,000 positions that he's going to be cutting. Um, and if you compare that historically, uh, right now we're neck and neck with where layoffs were through the end of April. 2023. In other words, if the month ended now, if April ended now, we would be on par with where we were at the end of April 2023. But we're going to keep Walgreens announced this morning that it was going to be laying off people at its headquarters. The layoff announcements keep coming and they tend to come right alongside earnings reports because right, that's how CEOs and CFOs make shareholders happy. In this kind of an environment, they're like, oh, no, we're not done cutting costs yet. We, we can cut more costs and make shareholders happier. And every time you hear a layoff announcement, boom, the stock pops. It's kind of magical that way, at least if you're the shareholder, as opposed to the person losing their job. My point is, David, by the end of April, we should be closer to 370,000 run rate as the layoffs keep coming from, call it a 340,000 starting point. That's the that that takes out your 2023, which was the highest since 2009, and it replaces it with 2024 as right. being the highest number of layoffs announced since 2009. I mean, I, I, like I said, for the people who are saying, "Where's the layoffs?" Are they referencing like, "Where's the layoffs?" circa you know 1930? I, I'm not sure how far back they want to go to see layoffs. But if you can't say that that the worst since 2009 is bad, then you've got a pretty you know dire view of the world dot, dot, dot ending because we're there. I, I, I think, OK, so I think I, I don't know what people are looking at, but I think what they may be referencing as the is the um, the unemployment rate that came in. Three point eight percent was the last number in March, not significantly higher from where 
when we talked in January, which is 3.7. So they're probably looking at that as no change. Uh, as you know, non-farm payrolls gains continued to be strong throughout last month. That probably weighed into their to their decision uh, making process as well when evaluating this. And like we mentioned, we talked about tech. So Elon Musk, yeah, laying off 10% of Tesla's global workforce. People may be wondering whether or not that's isolated to just that company or tech, or we're seeing a broader, you know, uh, industrial sort of layoff at work here. So I'll let you address those three things. Sure. Unemployment rate not yet ticking up. Non-fall payrolls continue to be strong. And, and tech sector being in trouble, yeah, but is that a leading indicator for anything? So three things to unpack here. The first is non-farm payrolls. February was revised down. So our, our string of downward revisions continues. Um, nobody really takes non-farm payrolls seriously anymore because of the depth and the duration of the of the of the downward revisions coming out of the BLS. The unemployment rate is another question. So the unemployment rate in uh, in in February was rounded up to three point nine percent. And month over month, the unemployment rate dropped by 2.8 basis points. So it rounded down to 3.8%. It was the smallest, it, it rounded down to 3.829% from like three point, it, it was the smallest of moves, David, the smallest of moves. One month rounded up, one month rounded down. What's important is not Claudia Somm, with deference to Claudia Somm, but a gentleman by the name of Ed McKelvey. And he was the, the chief economist at Goldman Sachs for a very long time. Uh, he crafted the McKelvey rule. He came out in January of 2009 and said to the Wall Street Journal at the time, you know, if, if the unemployment rate rises by 0.35% and holds that level of gain for three months running, look throughout history, we've always been in recession. And he made this kind of controversial mm -hmm. uh, interview with whoever you were in, in 2009, in January 2009, whoever the David Lynn was of the day at the Wall sure. Street Journal. He made this, uh, and, and sure enough, the National Bureau of Economic Research dated that recession to, um, to December. Sorry, he made the, he, he did the interview in January 2010, and the National Bureau of Economic Research dated the recession back to December 2009 when the McKelvey rule was triggered. Okay. My point here is the McKelvey rule was triggered in February and it's remained above sufficiently far above 3.4% for more than three months, 3.4% being the low for more than three months, 3.4 to 3.8%. So we're in recession as far as the unemployment rate is concerned, because the only thing that history tells us matters is where your starting point is and what the change, what the delta is from there, and if it's held. And because we've come from 3.4% to 3.8% and it's held for longer than three months, right. we're in the soup. So it's just a matter of time. Now, is this isolated to tech? No, no. 13 months running now, we've seen negative year-over-year -year movement in car sales. It's not just a, an electric vehicle phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It's not just a Silicon Valley phenomenon. We have layoffs that are across the board, across the U.S. economy. We've had we've had thousands and thousands of stores close or be announced that they're going to be closing in 2024. I understand the pushback. Well, these were dying anyways. These were walking wounded. You know, th these 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 chains were going to be going out of business anyways, Danielle. I'm like, okay, I got that. But all of them employed people, whether it's the, the latest round of 53 more Rite Aid stores that are going to be closing, or of course, Macy's announced, you know, more than a thousand stores that are, or Journeys closed down, or Bath and Body Shop completely, all of these liquid, Joanne stores, there goes thousands of stores. And I understand that maybe everything's being replaced by Amazon, but you can't pretend that these physical sites didn't employ tens of thousands of people who now are out of a job that have nothing squat to do with Silicon Valley. By the way, I spoke with Claudia Stahl. I asked her about this rule. She said, this, these are her words. She said, yes, I expect this rule to be triggered. This was before it was triggered. And I expect this time to be different. 
So I expect this uh, this rule to be broken. That's that's what she said. I'm just a messenger. Um, but uh, oh, I'll let you I, comment I on that. that. I, I've heard that. And I mean, all I can say is bless her heart in an election year for denying her entire professional body of work. Uh, she, yeah, this time will be different, she said. Is this time different, though? So I'll let you comment on that. Retail sales came in really strong. Right. This is an article. I'll just read the way okay. Yahoo Finance framed this. Retail sales surged 0.7% in March as Americans seem unfazed by higher prices with jobs plentiful. That is the headline. Please mm. evaluate that. Yeah. Uh, that, that's just a massive headline. And there's just there's a lot to chew on there. And you know, if you look, 65% of retail sales was online. And you know, talk to talk to the CEO of Walmart, talk to the CEO of Dollar General. They're like, people are really price sensitive. Now, where do you shop if you're the most price sensitive? The most price sensitive, you're online. You're looking nationwide for the cheapest price. Now, what's been outpacing retail sales growth for nine quarters, not nine months, nine quarters, what's been outpacing retail sales? Well, the answer is the growth in credit card spending. And it's easy enough to have nice support for retail sales if you're predicating that strength on the fact that you're putting it on plastic and you're going to pay it another day. And again, these are you know, the Philadelphia Fed came out last week and they're like, well, credit card delinquencies, you know, we started the data in 2012. They've officially moved off that chart. They're higher than they were in 2012 as far back as we have the data. And we're seeing one bank after another, big bank, regional banks, they're like, you know, everything's great except our credit card charge-offs. You know, uh-oh, sorry, they, ju they just hit a new record. Don't, shh, don't tell. Um, but the reality is we're still spending as a nation. Yes, we are. But we're extremely price sensitive and we're charging it. And amiss the highest layoffs since 2009, with the unemployment rate up to a significant enough degree to tell us that we're in recession. So I can be a headline writer and paint any picture I want. But if you if you tell me how the spending is occurring, what's underwriting and financing it, and in the background, all of these you know, individuals who are being led. And by the way, 2023, we're talking about six, nine months of severance pay. These were high paying white collar jobs. When Joanne Fabrics closes or a Rite Aid store, that's a state law dictating that you get 60 to 90 days of severance. And then yeah. you're in the soup. Here's okay. So you're right about credit card delinquencies. It's, so it's been going up dramatically since 2021, bottomed in 2021 at 1.58%. It's currently at 3.1%, the highest since 2012, which is what you said. Here, here's my argument. And please um, challenge me if you think I'm wrong. It's sure. just normalizing because historically, if you look before 2008, it was hovering bef between 3.5 and 5.5%. So yes, it's going up, but it's just returning to a post-pandemic normal. Nothing really wrong with that. Well, that's, um, you know, it, it's true. It's just returning to a, well, it's not returning to a post-pandemic normal, of course, because it's higher than it was in 17, 18, or 19. It's the highest since it was in 2012. Um, and it's normalizing against a backdrop of the unemployment rate being up to a sufficient degree that tells us th that we're in recession. So, so as the unemployment rate continues to rise against a backdrop of record high credit card delinquencies, what does that tell us about where credit card delinquencies are headed? as the layoff announcements continue to come. Because our starting point is a record high, a normalized. I mean, they use the word normalization, by the way, David, to flag delinquencies moving beyond subprime. Anytime a lender, CEO of Discover, or any of these companies says, well, we're seeing delinquency rates normalize. That means that they've bounced through the ceiling of being isolated to subprime borrowers into your prime borrowers. And that's exactly what we're seeing. But again, we don't even have an un unemployment rate of 4%. Imagine what they're going to be then. They'll be super normalized. Well, ultimately, I think people want to know, do you still think that more layoffs or more unemployment will hit the hit the uh, numbers here, the books, because it's already happened? Like you said, is it over? Oh, I mean, I've never seen a, a, a layoff cycle be over after just a few months. That's okay. not how it works. 
It's not how it works at all. And you know, okay, so you've got, call it 340,000 people who've lost their jobs so far in 2024. So they're right. gonna be consuming less going forward when, when people consume less, that means that you need fewer workers to produce less. And that's typically what perpetuates mm -hmm. an employment cycle, as opposed to just working under the assumption that it's just going to come and go quickly. That That's not how it works. Unemployment feeds unemployment. Yes. Okay. Well, let's talk about what the Fed is going to do. So the Fed looks at unemployment and inflation with the latest inflation numbers coming in much harder than expected and with oil surging continuously with the war in, um, in the Middle East escalating. People are wondering whether or not a Fed pivot is even still on the table. What do you think? Well, and, and, and with good reason, because there are so many people who are like, we're going to be raising interest rates before you know it. Uh, and it's so easy to sell a new sparkling toy. And, and this is the new narrative. Well, so here's the thing. If, if we're, if we are, we're, we're right now, we're 11.6 basis points away, 11.6 basis points away from the unemployment rate being 3.829% to 3.945%. And believe it or not, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they, they report this on a three digit basis. So, so if we get to 3.945% from 3.829%, and it sounds like I'm splitting hairs and I am to make a point. If we get there and we're rounding up from 3.945% to a 4.0% unemployment rate, what's just happened, David? What's just happened is the Federal Reserve on December the 14th, said, we expect the unemployment rate to end 2024 at 4.1%. Now, in their mid-March meeting afterwards in the summary of economic projections, aka the dot plot comes out, and the Fed said, you know what, we expect the unemployment rate to end 2024. So when the December unemployment rate is reported in January, we expect for that number to be 4.0%. So they lowered the bar. They lowered the bar. And what does that mean about Fed policy? That means that instead of triggering a rate cut when the unemployment rate hits 4.1%, that was the bar to cross in mid-December. Now we just have to cross 4.0% to trigger a Fed rate cut cycle according to their projections. This is their dot plot, not mine, not yours. Their dot plot says we need for the unemployment rate to go from 3.829% to 3.945%, an 11.6 basis point new move between March and the December report. Okay, so from 3.829%, just 11 points. And we expect for that to not occur until February of 2025, we expect for the unemployment rate to freeze and not move at all. Because if it does, you've just triggered a rate cut. This is me calling BS on Wall Street based on what the Fed has told us it's going to do. It lowered the threshold to begin cutting rates. I'll miss a layoff cycle that really is happening. I mean, if you believe that 2009 was a bad time for the US economy. If you don't believe that, fine. Meet me somewhere else, one-on-one, -on -one, online, and we can talk about the labor market in 1930, and that being the more realistic parallel. Yeah, yeah. I I've heard the argument, this is the cost push theory of inflation, that higher rates is actually causing some of the inflation. Do you subscribe to that theory? Because interest costs are high for businesses, and so they need to keep their prices high, right? I mean, you know, no, no. Um, I don't because it, it, it's an interesting thought, but corporate profit margins have never been as fat as where they are right now, according to the national accounts. So businesses aren't getting eaten alive. High risk borrowers, high yield borrowers, junk borrowers, they're in the soup. And they're having a really hard time. The, 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 the level of distressed debt piling up out there. Don't get me wrong. If you're, if you're a, credit worthy corporate borrower, pony on up. If you're not, good luck. Because Bloomberg ran a story yesterday that said 
you know, uh, banks are having to quietly pre-market high yield bond sales because they're getting pushed back. And I'm like, okay, don't tell anybody, but if you're not a great borrower, you're having a hard time, but that is not causing inflation to rise. In fact, if you look at the CPI simply for discretionary CPI, it's at 0.7%. You want to know why? You mentioned oil prices being higher. I told you that auto insurance, or I'm telling you auto insurance is up 22% year over year. The cost to repair your car is up 6.7% year over year. Obviously, I just said filling up your gas tank is more expensive. It's still expensive to go to the grocery store. The cost to insure your home has gone up. We call this non-discretionary CPI. When you isolate non-discretionary CPI, the cost of what you must buy, as opposed to, I love that new dress, I've got to have it, as opposed to the things that you want to buy. You're comparing discretionary CPI of 0.7% year over year to non-discretionary CPI of 4.7%. Are Americans pissed off because the cost of essentials is through the roof? They are. Does the Fed have any bearing on the cost of essentials? No. Okay. Well, ultimately, then, what do you think is going to happen to core CPI or PCE, rather, which is what the Fed looks at? You have here a chart showing um, super core and ultra core CPI. Tell us what you've done here. You've stripped away some things that um, are more volatile, should I say? Yes. Shelter included? Not more volatile, but less controllable. Okay. So, you know, Wall Street right now is on this huge super core kick. Yes, Chair Powell invented the super core CPI. It didn't exist. He pulled this metric out of thin air because it's an inflation reading that never goes down. So, I mean, clever, clever boy. He wants a reason to stay higher for longer. Good for him. Invent the super core. How big is the super core, Danielle? Well, let's see. Shelter is a 34% input to the CPI. So it's the largest weight in the CPI. Should be what what it costs to put the roof over your head. That's that's any household, any given household's largest line item in their budget. So it should be the highest weight in the CPI. The super core is 28% of the CPI, not far behind it. So 28% of the CPI is this super core, and it's reflective of sticky inflation. And the Fed's gonna have to be higher for longer. Well, all right, let's take the merry month of March. Of that 28% that's feeding into the CPI, when you isolate auto insurance and the cost to repair your car, now auto insurance, like I said, it's up 27, 22% year over year. The cost to repair your car is up like 7% year over year. It should be, right? You bought a piece of junk during the pandemic that had 140,000 miles on it, and it's 140% loan to value, upside down loan. And it's really expensive to repair this jalopy, this lemon. So the cost that your maintenance or repair guy is charging, He's justified in increasing it. What about progressive auto insurance or whoever insures your car, USAA? Of course, they're charging you much higher car insurance premiums because new car prices almost peaked out at $50,000. Replacing that car is pretty darn expensive. Or replacing that used car, if you total it, is pretty darn expensive. Why are Americans burning their cars? Literally, I'm not making this up. Americans are burning their cars. Well, where, where are you reading this? What happened? Now, Americans are in, 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 just look it up. Okay, auto, I, I will. I haven't Google, seen this, but Google auto arson because people are like, I can't get out of the car. I need to borrow another car. I can't afford to repair the car. I certainly can't afford to insure the car. I just accidentally will burn down in the middle of the night. The car is going to burn up. It's actually happening. In any event, Supercore is 28% of the CPI. Of that, 16% in the month of March was accounted for by these two little inputs of auto insurance and auto repairs. You strip those out of the super core that's 28% of the CPI, and all of a sudden the year over year increase of 4.8% that scared the bejesus out of the bond market last week becomes 2.4%. So we kind of, at QI Research, we played a little bit of fun with Chair Powell. We said, it's not super core inflation, which is up 4.8% year over year. We're gonna strip out two little categories that Chair Powell has zero influence over called auto insurance and the cost to repair your car. And all of a sudden, the super core becomes the ultra core. It's like Superman on steroids. The ultra core inflation rates 2.4%. I'm sorry, you're excited about what exactly now? 
And that's what Wall Street's hysterical about. Retail sales through the roof. And on top of that, the cost to insure your car through the roof. Speaking speaking of cars, I don't know if you saw in Canada where I'm based. In Toronto, there's been a record number of car thefts to the point where the police have told people that you should probably just leave your car keys out. And so you could avoid a confrontation with a criminal and a thief. That's what they actually said. So it's I don't know if that's a leading indicator for anything, but it, it's gotten pretty bad up here. Um, you have so, wait, the, so, so people are strategically to avoid getting robbed. They're no, the, the 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 cops said this was a town. This is a video you could you could see online. This is a, there was a town hall. People asked the police who was giving a presentation, "What should we do about this problem?" And he said, "Well, to avoid a confrontation with a thief or a criminal, just leave your car keys out to prevent." the possibility of being attacked in your home, leave your fobs at your front door. Again, because they're breaking into your home to steal your car. They're, they don't want anything else. Other so that they're arresting have guns on them and they're not toy guns, they're real guns. They're loaded. You know, <laughs> on the porch or something. Just make it, you just, just. Just make it easier. Yeah. I wonder if that's going to make auto insurance go up even more in Canada. Like, <laughs> probably. Being like, you know, you leave a cute little bowl out in front of your so, house. So, like, somebody, <laughs> somebody asked, a reporter asked the mayor of Toronto, they said, hey, look, um, we've been compared to the candy of car, the candy store of car thefts, something like that. And she said, well, we must have a lot of nice candy, meaning nice cars. Line recently for car thieves, Toronto is a candy store. What do you make of the fact that Toronto has this reputation? I guess we have a lot of candies. We have a lot of good cars here in Toronto. Um, yeah. So it's <laughs> gotten to be such a big problem. They just admitted defeat. Um so that's happening in Canada. Uh, but safety first. Going, safety first, David. <laughs> going down back down south in the US, you um I, I want to know what the Fed is gonna do ultimately. So we've talked about inflation. How many hikes or not hikes? Well, actually, some people have said a hike is on the table, but how many cuts or hikes, whatever you think is gonna happen, can we expect let's this year? Just, let's just say that the unemployment rate does not move before the July move, but before the July FOMC meeting. Let's just say it stays at 3.8% below the Fed's 4% threshold. Well, if if it doesn't get there in the next two payroll reports, if, if it doesn't hit that 4.0%, going from 3.829% to 3.945%, just as didn't have a move, well, then, then you're starting to talk about maybe the September FOMC. That's right before an election. That's that's the FOMC right before the presidential election. And, and Chair Powell's made it pretty darn clear he does not want to be seen as trying to sway the outcome of the election. You know, that could push us to November or December, where we've only got one rate cut for the year, which makes the policy error that much bigger because they're whistling about 3.829% to 3.945% while the United States burns. Do, do you agree that broader inflation will not come down until the stock market's correct because the wealth effect needs to take take hold and people need to feel poorer or actually have less wealth before they spend less? Uh, no, because the spending intentions in these surveys of the wealthiest people are coming down the fastest. So if, if the wealthy were indicating, you know, I'm headed, you know, to the Maldives for an extended vacation, but they're not they're actually saying, you know what, we're battening down the hatches. And that means that the wealthy don't have as much faith in the durability of their paper wealth as you would think. So, and that has to do, again, remember what I said, discretionary inflation is 0.7% year over year. So people are refusing to pay up for the things in life that they want. And that's why, you know, every month you're like, oh, sorry, shh, auto sales disappointed again. These are discretionary purchases. And the price of that is falling. We're in goods deflation. We have been for months. Well, you have a chart showing this, actually, the um, of people with over 125K of income a year. Uh, restaurant spending's down, airline spending's down, lodging spending's down. Well, so who's doing the discretionary spending of the retail sales? I mean, that's I told you we have, nine, we have nine straight quarters of of individuals who are where where credit card spending is outpacing retail sales. So it's people with less than 125K income. Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. And they're fully expecting. And if you tweet about it, they're like, ah, the government's going to send me a check any day now. Mm. And I'm, have you seen Mike Johnson? Because the guy who's running the House of Representatives, all he can do is manage to keep the lights on. 
and, and stop the government from shutting down with the infighting in his party, there's just not a big stimulus check coming until April of 2025 after there's a new administration and after there's a new Congress that's willing to send every American a stimulus check to pay yeah. off their card bills. But before that happens, they ain't nothing. Ha- but people are operating under the assumption, it's okay, the government will come to the rescue. Okay. Well, let's finish off on your asset allocation strategy. First of all, is gold going up to the moon a signal for anything? Well, yeah, it's a signal that central banks are all buying it. So in any market, if there are more buyers than sellers, the price is going to rise. And you know, I mean, what percentage of Chinese households own gold because they don't trust their government to not devalue their currency? I mean, an extraordinary, I mean, the Chinese household ownership of gold is, is bigger than any other country on planet Earth. On top of that, the People's Bank of China has been piling into it, along with every other central bank in the world. Sometimes that also tells you that the world is becoming concerned that you can no longer compare the concentration of the top 10% of, of components of the S&P 500 to 2000. It's the same people who want to know where the layoffs are. Because the only comparison you have to the top 10% of market capitalization stocks in the S&P 500 now, it's no longer comparable to 2000. It's only comparable to 1929. If if the economy unfolds the way you and I have talked about this year, do you expect a rotation into treasuries? I do. And I expect right now that everybody else is on the other side of that trade, which is pushing yields te- on a technical level higher. Yeah. So I think this is a massive crowded trade. Okay. The, uh, the reality is going to catch up. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, ultimately, where should we be? On the wrong side of that trade, yeah. Now, yeah. look, the S&P 500 could easily melt up from 5,000 to 6,000. It went from 4,000 to 5,000 in 12 weeks. We've told our clients, allocate a small portion of your portfolios to the potential for that last leg of a melt up. Go for it. But rent it, don't own it. It's the bottom line. And you're still getting paid for all of the, you know, Fed pivot, blah, 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 you're still getting paid north of 5% on your cash to just sit back, drink beer, wa- eat popcorn and watch the drama go by. Right, right. Fantastic. What? Uh, where can we learn more about your work, Danielle, QI Research? And um, yep. what are you working on these days? So if you don't follow me on Twitter, then clearly your life is just boring. So come to <laughs> Acne Martino Booth. Uh, and then, you know, we publish the Daily Feather every single trading day. So come to dmartinobooth.substack.com. As off the rails as I talk and as pure and faithful as I am to the data, and it's just data, folks, don't yell at me and say where are the layoffs when corporate America has already told us exactly where they are and they're being tracked daily at QI Research. So, but come to demartinobooth.substack.com and and find out what the truth is as, a bear, as opposed to what the the street narrative wants you to believe that it is. It's just data. Okay. Yeah, you tweet some interesting charts as well. So please uh, follow Danielle on her Twitter and uh, check out QI Research link down below. Thank you very much for your time again today. We'll speak again soon. Thank you, David. Take care. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.